It's time for AgriChat, the official podcast of the Tales of the Agronaut blog and stalwart gaming community, where we talk about stuff and things and the stuff about the things, and sometimes gaming. I'm Belgast, and let's start the show. Hey folks, it's that time again. Time for another episode of AgriChat. This is episode 434. Tonight I'm joined by Grace. Who the hell is Edgar? Kodra. Uh, isn't he a spoony bard? Damn. Hello. And Thalen. Jack Black should record a children's album. Really should. And it's kind of like, like his, his music is so good, but it is so not not for children. If your child loved peaches, good luck finding any other Jack Black song that you can safely let him listen to. Yeah, like I thought maybe the video game song would be nope. fine. Nope. <laughs> yeah, I had I had about two seconds of hey, my kid would think this is oh my wow no. I mean, especially the 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 Mario segment where he hits the block and gets a penis mushroom. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so uh, honestly, tribute only has I think one swear word in it, and it's barely audible. I think that depends on which version. Maybe maybe there's a version that's less. You know you know you know what song is it it has more than one swear word? Karate. <laughs> Karate has all the swear words. Actually it only has one swear word just over and over and over. Yep. <laughs> but it's such a good song. But if you think about it, like they might be giants lyrics are no weirder than Jack Black's. No, no. And they have released multiple highly successful children's albums they're pretty great actually they they really are i mean they're they're great for just normal listening yeah no i love i love elements elements is amazing did you know elephants are made of elements and they're (laughs) educational too and if they get the science wrong they'll record a new album yes the sun is actually made of plasma the sun is the sun is made of plasma the sun is a miasma of incandescent plasma. <laughs> yes. So speaking of music, um, I don't know how many years ago it was that I started watching Eurovision every year, if I could, you know, actually catch it. Um, but it's been several years, like at least five, six, something like that. I mean, they did they did eventually start letting Americans see it. So yeah. Oh no, no, this year's total bullshit when it comes to the American viewing of uh, Eurovision because it's on Peacock. Yeah, this and, year and last what? year they started airing it on Peacock. But it was you know, it was free on Peacock last year. This year you have to have a premium subscription to watch it. Nobody wants a premium subscription to Peacock. No, nope. no. Good lord. So you know, my, my mother bless. has a premium subscription to Peacock because she wants to watch her stories. And she's <laughs> the only person I know. Seriously. But anyway, God bless Sweden because their television channel streams free over the internet, even internationally. So nice. nope. <laughs> no clue what they're saying in the commentary, but that's okay. Which, I mean, I guess it's good that they did this public service. Because they completely robbed several great acts of Eurovision. It's true. Let's be clear. I'm not watching Eurovision. When I watch Eurovision, I'm not watching Eurovision for people speaking in English. No. Like, I mean, a good Eurovision song is catchy enough to drill its way into your head and also has an outrageous stage act. Yes. Some level of nonsense is absolutely required. If you if you are not dressed like a random MMO character, you do not deserve to be on the stage at Eurovision. Right. And like this year there were several really great acts and like I thought like as compared to last year, this year was a much better show. Um like there were a couple of really good acts last year. Um I mean I liked the hand washing song. Um there, there were several other acts that were good, but like this year, you had uh, Finland with the Cha 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 song, which is amazing. Absolutely robbed. I have no clue what's going on in that song. Um, there's the Edgar Allan Poe song, which is from Austria, which should have won the whole thing, but only got 17 worldwide votes or 16 <laughs> worldwide votes or something stupid like that. 
that's too intellectual. Um, but like everyone threw votes at Sweden and my key complaint is like, first of all, I had no clue who this artist was, but apparently why lots of Europe is up in arms is they're an established act. Like they won Eurovision in 2012. That, I mean, isn't that like against the entire purpose point of Eurovision? I don't think it's actually against the rules, but I think it's definitely against the spirit. This is only the second time that that is has ever happened where the same act has won twice. Like it's, it's meant to be amateurs. I thought, I don't I, know. I, I thought that too, but apparently not. So yeah, I'm, I'm real salty. Um, lots of, lots of, uh, you know, this is my first year participating in Eurovision on Mastodon. And that was delightful. <laughs> um, but you know, like lots of people were salty about this. Mastodon does seem to have the right vibe to, to, to be an entertaining place to, to watch Eurovision together. Yeah. So now, now I'm, I, I thought I knew what Eurovision is, but now I feel like I really don't. So it's usually like non-musicians or amateur musicians. No, I mean, a lot of those people, I think, are professional musicians. It's just that they haven't necessarily broken out from you know, either local or their country's scene. Yeah. There's there's definitely people like they're they're not amateurs by any stretch of the imagination. It's it's not meant to be like people that you've really heard of though. Right. I mean like the 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 token example of the Eurovision story is ABBA. Like yeah, they okay. were they were a unheard of nobody before Eurovision and became global sensation. Yeah. So um, and this is part of why people are complaining a little bit about how the votes ended up this year, because it just happened to work out that Sweden won, so they get to host next year on the 50th anniversary of ABBA's win. Right. Just uh, coincidentally. So, mm. Yeah, and like to explain, during the voting round, like each country calls in and like says who gets their biggest vote. Um, and I don't remember what the breakout is like. The biggest one is 12 points. Um, and then like it, it, it degrades down from there. Like they give, you know, like what, nine points to somebody and it's one through 10 and then 12. Okay. But yeah, like, so, so they only really announced the big one, but like country after country after country called in and gave Sweden their 12. So by the time they got to the, uh, the audience voting section, they were like up 300 points or something like that. Wow. And then Finland managed to take it away from them for a few minutes. Cause they had like, I don't know, 530 or so points. And, uh, Sweden would have had to have gotten 180 points from the audience and they got like 200 points from the audience. So. I do think I have one final pertinent question about this whole thing. Where is Australia located? Look, <laughs> look, Europe is a very broad term. It's something to do with the broadcasting. Like there is some broadcasting deal. So the Australians were there and then they were just like, maybe you should sing. Um, well, I, I, th- I, I, I thought, thought it was because, because they were part of the Commonwealth. <laughs> Yeah. No, it's well, but, it's something but, to do with the broadcasting and the way the broadcasting deals is set up. What Grace is saying makes more sense to me because why wouldn't Canada be in this? No, Canada is in it. Are they? Yeah, no, Canada gets to vote too. Uh, okay. Do they send it? It's act basically as well? everyone but the United States. Wait, what? I didn't think Canada. I thought Canada. Right. I thought no. Canada voted. I, they. I don't think they perform. I don't know. They certainly were not in the semifinals. Can it, Canadians are allowed to vote in Eurovision. They I mean, ju- they are officially joining Eurovision in 2023. So this was the first year, I guess. Ah, uh, okay. That makes more sense. And this year they also opened up a everyone else in the world vote. So technically, yeah, we have no pay one, 20 euros. Right. We have no one but ourselves to blame. <laughs> for- like, you literally have to pay 20 euros to vote. I mean, Israel's been in Eurovision since the 70s, so who even knows? There's a very broad definition of Europe. Clearly. 
But anyway, your vision is always delightful. I'm not surprised. I'm just sad at the way that the vote went. But there's always next year for some kind of nonsense. I mean, at least last year we got a mad flute solo. Anyway, I, I, I am sure like 0.0003% of our listeners care about this. <laughs> Well, that's tough for them because this is a podcast about stuff and things is stuff about things and this is definitely stuff about things it absolutely yep. is stuff about things we didn't even talk about the video game song wait there was a video I, game song i liked that song <laughs> i didn't love the song but their stage act had like a gundam in it so yeah <laughs> okay and One and like incredible. i don't know like it said fight like a fighting game and it had various things. It was kind of Linkin Park meets Nine Inch Nails with uh, a, a weird dude on the stage singing unrelated things to Gundams, but there was absolutely a Gundam. Huh. Seriously, like, I mean, generally speaking, Eurovision is pure joy, so you should totally watch it. It's awkward as hell because, you know, you never exactly know when it's going to be on, so you have to kind of plan ahead. While watching Eurovision... I played some Diablo 4 because this is another test weekend, and I was mostly curious what changes were made since the last round. What changes were made? It's hard to, like, put a finger on all of the tangible changes, but basically, like, Barbarians felt much better than they did. Like, for Barbarian, it felt like... So everything in that game scales as you level. So it felt like... The further into the game I got, the weaker I felt because my gear and or talents and or whatever were not keeping up with the the damage and tankiness of the mobs. Um, So, like, they, they seem to have fixed that. Like, barbarians don't feel anywhere near as quick as, say, necromancers did last time, Um, but it's better than it was. Uh, combat in general felt a little bit better. Um, on the negative side, they have massively nerfed drop rates. Uh oh. Which is not, I mean, like, not to be surprised because, like, you were getting legendaries left and right last time around. Sure. I got a single legendary during 20 levels of play. So, so the top end gear wasn't dropping for you. The, the important thing was. Were you otherwise able to keep up with gear? Like, was the, like, not top-end gear dropping such that you were able to, like, maintain the power level you needed yeah, for I the mean, game to feel well? And I I had I had a mishmash of plus or minus 10 levels worth of gear, and it still felt okay. So it didn't feel like I was undergeared. Um, it's just so much of the build craft in Diablo 4 centers around having specific legendaries so none of the builds really felt complete um like I didn't even have a full bar worth of abilities um at 20 so mm -hmm. wait do you get abilities from your gear uh well you do but you also get about abilities from from spending talent points in a tree um but but that is one weird thing is like if you pick up a sword and it's got plus one level to X ability, you get that ability at level one. So like picking up gear does give you abilities that you may or may not already have, but just like through spending talent points, I hadn't gotten a full set of abilities yet. Mostly because I was, I mean, like it's partially my own fault. I was trying to beef up my survival to see if I could make it feel better than it did previously. I really don't love riding my potion button if I don't have to. I don't know. Like it, it is, it is in a better state than it was, but it's still very much not what I expect from an ARPG. It is going to be a perfectly cromulent game. It's just much slower pace than I expect. Yeah. Combat felt kind of sluggish and slow, but I mean, they did make some improvements. So, I mean, I guess that's a good sign. I would say that's probably fine. As long as like the game still feels fun. Yeah, and I'm not sure if I if I find it fun. I that's the piece that I that I kind of struggle with cuz like on one hand it's fine and it it's mechanically fine, but it doesn't 
necessarily feel like I generally expect an ARPG to feel. And the leveling is slow enough that like, I'm not sure how anyone's going to want to reset after three months and play it all again. Oh, are they going to be doing the same Seasons, like, yeah. seasonal thing? Yep. Yep. Yeah. And they're, that's, uh, and they're not going to have a leaderboard for two seasons because they're afraid of cheaters. Eh. So like, that's not a great sign either, but I, I guess I'm going to say I already kind of dropped path of exile because I felt like it was too slow for me to level up for giving me a character who had an expiration date. Yeah, I mean, I could see that, but, like, it speeds up over time. Like, my the latest character that I'm playing, my Explosive Aereo Champion, uh, like, I made it on Friday night, and by Sunday morning, it was fully geared and mapping. Yeah, and, and while I do understand that, I guess, like, my point is, if Diablo 4 is going to slow you down and also give you an expiration, that is not in... in encouraging me to think this is a game for me right yeah no like it's going in the wrong direction <laughs> like if if poe which like i find okay is already too slow then yeah no d4 is going to be way too slow uh, we, we kind of talked about this um last week with redfall but like i do think there's amount of like this this game just might not be for you and that right. might be okay like it doesn't have, mean that the game has to be bad. It just might not be for you. And there are so many games coming out. Right. It might be okay to skip it. Yeah, that's that's where I am with D4 right now. It is a perfectly decent game, but it is not what I am looking for, especially in an ARPG. I think if I switched my mindset and thought about it as an MMO... It might be more what I'm looking for. Still not super thrilled with it, but that's okay. Lots of other people seem real excited about it, and that's great. I have other things that I am more interested in, and that's fine too. Yeah, and, and I tried playing it with a controller to see if that magically made it better, and it, it was a little bit better, but not significantly different. <laughs> Yeah, it definitely feels like they went down the combat should feel weighty camp, which to me just makes everything feel sluggish and slow. Yeah, I don't want that in an RPG. Yeah, like, like I want explosions and loot flying everywhere and, you know, random minions just dying in my Te presence. <laughs> Teleporting everywhere, clearing well, the screen. I mean, I actually feel like a problem some ARPGs have is combat already feels like combat feels weighty in the sense that like, if you get hit with the wrong thing, you might not realize that you got stunned before you're dead. Like there's plenty of weightiness to combat in ARPGs in the form of like your attacks have various things that cause enemies to like get knocked back. And it's really, it's actually very good at being like, well, you hit somebody, they're probably going to get knocked back and like they're not going to recover quickly. But then you get hit and you the problem is, is it's almost too visually busy for weighty combat to be something super desirable. Right. Yeah. And and I think that's part of it, too, is that they're trying to limit the total number of things on screen so that you can have a slower paced, more you know deliberate combat style. But also, it kind of makes it feel like it takes forever to go from combat to combat. So there's a lot of time where you're not doing anything. You're just running to the next pack. Which is inherently like a problem with an MMO design. Is you spend a lot of time traveling between packs of mobs. Because you're, you're beating the spawn rate. I don't know. It'll be interesting. Like, there's a lot of people that seem to really like it, though. So... I, I hope it continues to be a good experience for them. It is a bummer uh, when a game that purports to be a thing that you love isn't really for you. Yeah, it happens. Like, <laughs> I I feel like I don't know that you actually put. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna slide this topic up. <laughs> I'm a master of segues, Bill. I know. Um, you have been. 
uh, going back and trying to play Breath of the Wild. I sure have. I don't remember this game being this hard when I played it on the Wii U. I am going to basically the first dungeon, which is the the or the the first divine beast, which is in the Zora's domain. And the path up there has a bunch of Lizalfos. Um and there's one Lizalfos commander that has a twin a, a twin Lizalfos boomerang. And when it hits me, it deals four at least four hearts of damage. I say at least because I only have four hearts of damage. And it just one-shots me. I don't remember Zelda games being this hard. Like, this this is, again, like, I, I do remember having fun with this game when I played it on the Wii U. So I don't know if I've accidentally enabled a hard mode somehow. Or if I am, need to go to a guide to be like, five tips on how to survive the early game of Breath of the Wild better. You won't believe number four. But, yeah, game's rough, and I don't think, like, if I think back to Zelda games, one of my things that I would really criticize Breath of the Wild on is, until you have done a few dungeons, like, most enemies deal half or quarter hearts worth of damage, and then, like, you fight a really scary thing that deals a full heart of damage. I don't know anything in other Zelda games that will deal more than like two. I think there might be a three heart attack, but usually like four hearts is that's a significant chunk. That would be like, uh, I don't even know if bosses deal that in older games. Yeah. I mean, also you just get more hearts from playing naturally. Yeah. You, you do get more hearts from playing. Like I have been going, I have been going to every single shrine I find, and granted, I did spend one shrine on stamina. Maybe that was a false choice. Maybe I shouldn't be spending uh, shrines on stamina. Yeah, but if you don't spend shrines on stamina, there you can't get to, you know, many of the little uh, whatever the the temples. That is exactly where my mind went, and so I did spend some part, but. That means I have four hearts at this point and I'm getting one shot. And I'm like, I'm just, I'm blown away that that happens this early on. This, this feels like my comment was, this feels more frustrating than playing Dark Souls. Like Dark Souls will send you back further and make you lose more progression. But I will like just constant, I will face tank my way through fights because that's like I basically have to execute them perfectly or I die. And there's a lot of AoE attacks in this area which are ex- they are at least somewhat random. It depends on if the enemy manages to shoot a shock arrow into water and there are lots of puddles of water just scattered around the area cuz it's constantly raining and the graphics aren't like the graphics are very beautiful but at night in the rain, it's very hard to tell what is a puddle and what is like a valley, a, a like gentle in recess into the ground. Like I vaguely remember eating shock resistant food to get through that area. I was given a shock resistant potion and I did eat it to get through one area, but there are like three areas with shock focused enemies. Yeah, and also, I don't know that you've got an answer until you get to, like, the Zora build it, or village. Uh, I mean, the answer could have been, like, oh, Reese, try, go craft some shock-resistant food. Probably look up a guide on the internet to figure out how to build shock-resistant food. It's, it, it, this, this is kind of, like, feels like the, the Minecraftization. Like, it's, it's very much just, hey, you can do anything. This game's very sandboxy, and I... Again, on the vein of there are games that everyone loves, but I think I it's like, this isn't for me. Like, this game might just not be for me. And uh, it's sounding like from reviews I'm reading, because I'm really trying to figure it out, Tears of the Kingdom might also not be for me, which is a bummer. Yeah, I, I had a very similar kind of like, oh, I didn't like Breath of the Wild, and everybody is heralding it as the best game ever. This is the future of Zelda. I guess I just am not into Zelda anymore. That sucks. Mm-hmm. Yup. 
and like people love it and i'm super glad that people love it like it's a as far as i can tell it's a <coughs> perfectly well-crafted game yeah i mean but my spicy take from the other day was like i think everything that breath of the wild is doing genshin impact did better that might be true but i also didn't get hooked <laughs> to genshin impact so what i think is interesting like as a point of comparison what i think is interesting is that of the of the just iconic Nintendo properties, Zelda has definitely become super polarizing every time they've deviated from the the mean, as it were. Mm-hmm. Mario, on the other hand, is absolutely bonkers in so many directions, and they and they it just nails the feel over and over and over again. Right, they they seem to be able to get the Mario ness every time they pivot. I mean that, that 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 said, my reaction to Mario sixty four was at back in the day when it came out was very similar to you guys' reaction to Breath of the Wild. Well, I like I think I had that initial reaction when I first heard about it, and then I sat down and played it, and I really liked it when I actually played it. I definitely think that what helps is that they re- there's enough Mario games released that if you don't like one of them, wait six months to a year. Yeah, and they yeah. do tend to alternate between the sorts of Mario games. Yeah, and they have also somewhat identifiable categories now yeah. of different of the different styles of Mario game. But they do all, as you said, sort of maintain their Mario ness. I mean, they are all very much jumping around platforms. But uh, like they aren't always. Because like they've done Mario RPG really wasn't. <laughs> Yeah, like yeah, Mario, but... every Mario RPG game is like just an incredible banger somehow. I okay, so I okay, maybe I would say I am considering all of the Mario platformers not necessarily the Mario RPGs. Oh, okay, yeah, I'm including those I, in Mario games. I'm including they are a everything. subclass of Mario game. And Mario Party is a subclass of Mario game. Yeah. Oh my goodness, no, I you know I'm gonna push back. I feel like a lot of these are game other games with. Mario Kart is different than like the mainline Mario platformer to me. A- absolutely. They're all different games, but they manage to retain the it doesn't feel you don't play Mario Kart and feel like, "Oh, this is a weird this doesn't fit as a it it feels weird that they used Mario for this." Well, I like I, I most weird stuff. I mostly don't feel that just because Mario has the history of being in just about every game. Like but I would say even the Mar- even a lot of the Mario platformers where Mario like they they take a lot of risks on the Mario platformers too and go in a bunch of different directions with those. And oh, they yeah. still always feel like they still retain the Mario platformer vibe. Yeah, that's I mean, and that's that's sort of the thing that I think is super cool. Like even when they're not doing you know, even when it's not Mario the platformer. They can go really weird with that. But even the platformers do all kinds of crazy stuff. I mean, like like Mario Galaxy is bonkers. Yes. It's amazing. They I somehow could... managed to make New Donk City and the T-Rex feel like things that just work in Mario. New Donk City should not work in Mario. Yeah. I think the challenge is kind of what you said just a few minutes ago, though, is they're always making Mario games. Yeah, it's felt like Zelda games have been way more rationed Mm -hmm. and even worse for Metroid games. Do you know what really makes me salty is how much I hate Metroid Dread. (laughs) That's not a game I wanted to play at all. Like I didn't want my I, I didn't want Nemesis from Resident Evil to be in a Metroid game like that is a beautiful game and it is well crafted. But I don't want to run away from things. Like I want to fight things. I mean, and, and and most of the game is just a regular Metroid game, and then then you have to deal with one of those robots. Right, exactly, and it ruins the flow of the rest of the game. It's it's like the 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 Deus Ex um, sequel problem. Like it does a human whatever where you could a- you could be sneaky, like you could be totally sneaky and not kill anything, and now it's time for a boss battle. I will say about that game, and it's very weird, uh, but, like, one of the things that I think that does well uh, is forcing you into a path that you might not have gone to. Just because, like, rather than going where you want, it 
like one of those things forces you to go somewhere else and that like breaks you out of your path and and feels a little bit more exploration-y. But I also totally get like, hey, I didn't like that. Well, I mean, there are other ways to do that too, where you could have a section of the platform that you're on fall down and take you to a new area. I just, I just didn't like being chased by things, but like this is, this also ties back to Diablo four because when a game takes forever to release the next version, you get irrationally hung up on the thing. And there's a certain amount of down cycling that you have to do in your emotions to detach yourself from it. And realize that, no, I I don't really like that thing. Yeah, it's sad when you know, well, it's going to be at least another 10 years before yeah, <laughs> before I mean, like, they come back around on this. And if I, I don't like it, then I'm just not going to have Diablo in my life for a while. I, I guess I'll revisit it in my 50s. I, <laughs> one of the things that I think is where, where I'm I'm okay with Zelda is like, Maybe this gives us an opportunity for somebody else to take a crack at that formula. Like, a I mean, lot of Tunic have, is a really good Zelda game. Yes, Tunic is a very good Zelda game and other things. Tunic's a weird game. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm not quite as bullish on Tunic as a good Zelda game, but it definitely has the trappings. It is a, and it, and it's a good game because it, it isn't Zelda. Like, if they, if Tunic had been released as a Zelda game, I'd probably be kind of annoyed with it. It's I mean, the Zelda of Dark Souls games. Yeah. Oceanhorn is a pretty good Zelda series. I mean, it's not as good as A Link to the Past, but it's not bad, and it's doing a lot of the same stuff. I'll just go back and play A Link to the Past for the umpteenth <laughs> time. I'm, I, maybe I will get into uh, Zelda Twilight Princess again. There's a lot of old Zeldas to go back to. It's true. And apparently Twilight Princess has a really good randomizer. I'm trying to exactly what I mean, honestly, I'm, pr- I'm pretty sure the main reason I didn't finish Twilight Princess was Wii Motion Controls. I should probably give it a try on, like, the Switch. Wait, you can't play it on the Switch, though. Oh, you can't? I just, no. I guess I just assumed that you could since you were bringing it up. No, you can't play it on the Switch. You'll have to figure something else out, wink, wink. Oh, uh, got it. Was there was there ever a, a 3DS version of Twilight Princess? Uh, <laughs> Seems no. unlikely. No. But yeah, but yeah, that was one of those games where I, I got it for the Wii because I had a Wii, and you know I should I should get the newer version. And then like the the motion controls for that game were, were, were very tiring. I didn't mind it, but I did mostly agree that I should have gotten it for the GameCube. the GameCube version. Yeah. But then you know what I did? I was like, I should I should not get the new version of Breath of the Wild pretty sure i made a mistake there by getting the wii u version because now i've had to get it for the switch so what i'll actually do is i'll go back and play wind waker again because that's a good one i was so so on ocarina of time i love wind waker yeah same i mean ocarina of time was fine majora's mask was also fine they weren't exactly what i wanted but i played through both i think ocarina of time is the zelda game i've played the most of I, I think that's like a generational thing. Yes. Link to the and, Past here. Yeah, Link to the Past was was the big one for me because it like it it paid off everything that I thought it could be with the original game. I think Wind Waker is probably mine just by happenstance of which consoles I had. Yeah, I can see that. I mean Wind Waker is really good. I think I liked I I basically liked every Zelda game up to Breath of the Wild, with very few exceptions. I definitely did. I didn't uh, play any of the Wii U or the Wii Zeldas. I really liked Skyward Sword. Like I tried to play Twilight Princess, but like I had a Wii and I had a GameCube, and I made the decision to buy it on the Wii because that was the newer platform. And I think I would have liked it better if I'd played it on the GameCube with a regular controller. So I just didn't love the motion controls. Okay, Grace, you've got a follow up on Burning Shores. Yes, I came on this podcast and said some things about Burning Shores, uh, Horizon Forbidden West, and I need to issue a retraction <laughs> because I have 
now played through all of the quests at least um, and uh, had an amazing time. Uh, the final quest and associated battles were really great um, and somewhat difficult. And I got to, luckily the game is very forgiving about letting you restart in reasonable places if you die. Um, But I got to the last phase of the fight and it was just like, felt very punishing and I was getting kind of frustrated with it. And I finally went, well, screw this. I'm just going to go and turn the difficulty down. And when I did this thing, (laughs) I discovered that right before I started playing the expansion, I had started a new game plus, and I had ramped up the difficulty quite a bit. <laughs> oh no! And apparently, that had transferred over to my regular save. Oh my! So I had played the entire expansion <laughs> at a higher difficulty setting. So I don't actually think it's a significant ramp up in difficulty from the base game. I was just an idiot who had the difficulty ramped up in my settings. <laughs> and when I bumped it back down, I finished the last fight and it was fine. Um, so check your difficulty settings, people, <laughs> if you've changed them for other reasons. <laughs> um, but yeah, the I finished the story. You know, it's still, there's, you know, the, the core story of Horizon Forbidden West is just... Re- it's interesting, but it's never going to live up to the original game, and that's okay. Um, but but this one was fine. It had some really great characters, and the last quest and fight sequence were like it was one of the coolest things I've done at a video game in a long time. I really enjoyed it, especially once I turned the difficulty down <laughs> where I wanted it to be in the first place. So, um, yeah, absolutely do recommend that content uh, if you've already got the base game. And it is not a huge jump in difficulty. (laughs) Sorry, folks. It is on my list for when I finish uh, Jedi Survivor. Nice. And I would be happy to talk about the story in, you know, the base game and the expansion at some point. But especially for this one, do not want to share any semblance of spoilers. Is it, but like, is it as spoilery of a game as the first one? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Like in very different ways, but yes. Yes. And and in the expansion, there's some cool vignettes and things that I wouldn't have wanted spoiled. So I don't even know how to to get into this topic. It's something that I was thinking about the other day. Um, I do not think borrowed power systems are good for the long-term health of a live service game. Can you define what borrowed power systems are? So this really start my, my awareness of this really started with world of Warcraft and they got into a series of, expansions where you would spend an entire expansion gaining artificial power through some MacGuffin that you're powering up and you're pouring resources into it. Um, You know, the artifact weapon, for example, is a prime example of this. And then after that, it became this necklace. And then uh, in that same expansion with the necklace, it was like, corrupted gear and the corrupted gear gave you new stats that you wouldn't normally have but there was a downside to it and then after that expansion there was something else and you know there was this whole sequence of expansions all the way through shadowlands where you are gaining artificial power but the power will only last for a single expansion um and that's less bad than what I've seen in like Destiny or um, even Path of Exile right now, where like in Destiny, every season you got some elevated power in this artifact. 
and then it would reset at the end of the expansion and or the end of the season and you would get something different um you know and and in uh path of exile like during the sanctum league if you got far enough in the sanctum you got a whole new inventory slot or not inventory but a whole new gear slot that had unique stats on it and that only lasted while the expansion was going on and then this league there's the crucible trees on weapons which have abilities that have never been in the game before and give you power and builds that you probably never will see again and what i've seen over time from communities is people get really bitter when you take away their toys mm-hmm. like i got a player fantasy during uh warlords of draenor that i got to play a sword and shield dps and it was amazing and it is gone forever <laughs> i i doubt that gladiator stance will ever come back and i will always be slightly bitter that that was a thing that i had once and i'll never have it again but like i don't know how one gets away from it but also it feels like you you once you start down the bar- borrowed power path a game has to kind of keep escalating in order to keep people's attention i mean why do you say that cuz like ultimately one of the ways you stay interesting is by constantly keeping things fresh by removing the borrowed power yes I don't know, like, but it just feels bad to lose the power. Yeah, and then you know, whatever you they end up replacing it with, like, people are still gonna miss whatever the old thing was. It always feels bad to have the power taken away at the start of a new season or expansion and have to ramp back up again. And it's different. I don't know. I feel differently about like leveling up my character. And then stepping into a new expansion and like, I understand that now I'm going to have to level up again. And so you feel a little fresh and things are a little difficult at first, but the leveling piece is a short piece and feels less bad to have to redo. Whereas something like, you know, the, uh, the Azure necklace and, like that stuff where you're just working on it for months and months and months and then it's just gone useless. Um, I don't know. It just, it does feel unpleasant. And and I think the problem is, is the, when you, when you take the thing away, the thing that it, it gets replaced with isn't always equivalent and doesn't always do the thing that you liked that the last thing did. I mean, one of the things that I that makes me think of is like it. It's kind of it kind of exposes the the treadmill. Yeah, it's like very you, much. Uh, it's an unmasking moment. <laughs> it's it's like, much more I, in your face that I'm I'm spending so much effort and time powering this thing up, and then it's going to go away at the end of this season expansion, whatever. Be- because I am old, for me, all I can think of is the moment they nerfed Thunder Fury. Because it turned out it didn't matter how powerful they made a weapon, they couldn't make it as powerful as Thunder Fury. Or any a lot of the old vanilla w- items, like uh, Mark of... Oh man, what was that item? The one that just gave you like 2% crit rate? Or 2% uh, auto rehit? Some Something... Hand of Justice? Yeah, that was, a, and, that was a big one. And, and like, that was when they had to reinvent all of the stats because they couldn't just be flat percentages. Otherwise, they couldn't possibly scale, and they had to create the idea of a, a crit rating. I mean, so, like, I, I get that if you have a game that lasts a certain amount of time, you need to keep it fresh. It's really important to keep it fresh. And you... You absolutely need to make sure that you don't have um, if you have if you have a game where your main reward stream is getting new and better items, it's really important that you never make an item that's just the best forever. Mm-hmm. Um, and like sometimes so it's like sometimes you've got to nerf stuff for the for the health of the game. But having 
a specific time where everybody gets nerfed feels kind of bad. Like it's, yeah. it's they they were planning to do this from the beginning rather than oh they realized this was way too good. And it's a function of how much effort you put into whatever the thing is, right? Like Yo. Diablo three in the current season, I guess you know they have the ritual altar thing, and it's a significant power boost, but it's also something that is pretty relatively easily obtainable within the normal amount of time that it takes me to complete a season. So it doesn't feel horrible to think that that might go away. Now, I don't know if it will because of what's happening with seasons in Diablo 3 right now, but um, you know, if it goes away and comes back later, it's fine because it took a reasonable amount of time to fill that thing up. Whereas some of the, you know, the the other treadmill type power items just you've you feel like you've you know gone after that grind for forever and well, then it gets taken away with with Diablo 3 like for me the thing that i miss that i know is probably never coming back are the angelic crucibles from the season before that gave you unique versions of legendary items that like you know whirlwind had basically the rune that pulled things into it that vacuumed targets to the whirlwind just as a default function of that item and it was a much better version than the one you get by putting a rune in whirlwind um and that was awesome but like that was a build that i got to play but i'll never get to play again because that item is now gone and there doesn't seem to be any sign of angelic crucibles coming back unless they just literally rotate through all the past seasons now that they're kind of going to be in maintenance mode. I don't know. Like I, I get that it's a challenge and it becomes cumbersome to try and maintain a decade worth of content as all relevant, but I've always hated when games remove things instead of just adding new things. I mean, that's what's what ultimately caused me to just stop playing destiny. That's exactly what's made me, stop playing destiny it's like is, oh half the planets just are gone and characters that i really liked are gone and i just can't even if i like start a new character i can't play through any of that stuff again it's just gone yeah and and even the story is that way to where if you weren't playing during x season you're never going to see the story that is now woven into the core of the game. Like it's, it's the living world season one problem. Like, and thankfully living world season one's back, but like, eh, what's, what's my point in ever getting back into destiny? Like I'm, I can't ever experience the entire game. Yeah. And that was one of the things that came out of a developer talk this week with De Diablo four is they're planning on having seasonal story content that only exists during the season. Ugh. Yep. Haven't we learned this lesson? No, no. They specifically have not learned this lesson yet. Everyone has to learn this lesson on their own. So so either I'm playing Diablo 4 from the beginning and never stop playing, or I'm just not going to play it. Right, sure basically. I can tell you which one of those two I'm going for. <laughs> yeah, I was exactly. going to say, like, oh, I thought maybe someday I might try Diablo 4, but it sounds like maybe I just won't. As... As somebody currently playing through Guild Wars, all of the story in order to try and get it, uh, it's, uh, I I'm now remembering that, like, much of season, much of season two and Heart of Thorns, how little it makes sense, and, like, suddenly there's this character here that you met maybe once, and then they're dead, and everyone's sad, and you're not sure why, and it's so weird. So, yes. Very glad that they uh, put s season one so that we can experience that. I'm looking forward to uh, to doing that again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been playing back through everything in the order in which it was released, starting with season one. And having that story makes everything better from that point forward. Ha have you been doing the, uh, did you do the original game? Yeah, I did on, on my Ranger. Yeah. It's yeah. the original game story is not great. No, but. no, it's not. I'm 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 on the level eighty quest right now, and uh, 
I'm like, I really wanted to know what was going on, but like already so many names are coming up that I'm supposed to remember. And I don't, I'm like, Oh no, this isn't something where like I played it poorly last time. This, this quest, this story is just a mess. Yeah. But Hey, it's better now that we at least get to see what happened. That introduced the characters that we actually are going to care about. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, we, we finally get to see just why exactly a, a a tiny, you know, child is just, you know, hanging around with the rest of us and acting like she's in charge. And it's because she's always been like that. Yeah, but you also get to understand that there are people that thought that was weird at the time. Yeah. <laughs> and, and yeah, and, and when she first showed up, we were like, wait, what? And then she adopted Bram and Bram ran with it. and. And thus, Timmy is just like just part of the, part of the group, and it's fine. Bram it's fine. more than anyone needs you to understand like why he has a perpetual chip on his shoulder. Yeah, having, I mean, he, he has a Bram, reason having Bram's original first appearance in the game. Like apart from any other portion of the story, just having his original first appearance and seeing him just tr trying to get through to Ritlock that hey. There's shit going down. I need your help. And not nobody listening rare. to him at all. His, his own he's, mom being terrible. Like, yeah, yeah he's, I get he's like, hey, I get it. All, all of all, the all, everyone who lives at the village that I currently live is dying and we need help. And everyone's like, nah. Yeah. And then he's like, hey, mom, everyone that I care about is dying. I need your help. And she's like, nah. Yeah. Because she's a terrible mother. Stop being weak. You're no son of mine. <laughs> Goodness. Happy Mother's Day, Aristogolkin. <laughs> Look, she 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 had a she had a destiny as a hero, and that was, you know, yeah, that's what mattered. Uh -huh. <laughs> Ridlock doesn't even have that excuse. He's he's just being an asshole. Yeah, but scans. Rit let's just say Ritlock getting thrown into the mist did some good for his personality. It really did. <laughs> he 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 spent some time in the mists. He, he fucked up real, real bad, and then he had to deal with the repercussions of his of his actions. And yeah, it took him down a few pegs, and he really needed that. Everyone should spend some time potentially dead? I guess. Worked for him. The, the times that Air has shown up as a ghost, you know, she has seemed... A little better, so <laughs> that's something, <laughs> no, I guess. I do not buy that. I mean, slightly. Like, I, isn't her like, she is dead and talking to her son is like, well, I tried. <laughs> no, you <laughs> did it. You're a terrible mom. And like, his takeaway is like, oh man, I'm glad I got that closure so I could really finally understand how much my mom sucks. Yeah. No, the, the, yeah, like Bram finally, right, finally realized that he he shouldn't be in his mom's shadow because she doesn't deserve that. <laughs> no wonder you're screwed up, kid. You had zero role models. And maybe it's less that I have a problem with borrowed power, and maybe it's a larger problem that I have of not being able to go back and experience content if I missed it the first time. Yeah, I mean that that's the biggest thing for me. Like I'm, I want I want to experience everything from the beginning, like without any breaks or interruptions, which, you know, becomes a problem when it's something like, I want to watch Doctor Who. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Well, and that's why I didn't get into Doctor Who until way late. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is what we're really kind of g d dancing around is FOMO in video games. Yeah, which, FOMO sucks. Yeah. And designing your video game to try and encourage a FOMO reaction might have a negative uh, effect of people not playing your game because they have already missed out. Yep. Yeah, that's the thing. is like FOMO either works really well or really badly, where if someone is currently playing it, it might give them a reason to continue playing it. But if someone has not played it, knowing that they're permanently missing out on things can act as a... Uh, obstacle to ever get them to play it in the first place. Yeah. I, th I think that's one of the reasons why I appreciate Final Fantasy 14 so well is that like, you can just come back whenever the hell you want to. Yeah. I do wish they would give us some way to 
experience the story of past holiday events. Yeah, yeah, same. Because that's the because that's the only thing in the game that if you miss it, you just you just can't play it. Yeah, and it won't be back because it's a new holiday event, a new event every year, which is great, and I like that. And you know, and it's minor, but I wish there was a way I could go back and experience past holiday events. Well, because the holidays kind of tell a progressive story mm-hmm. as it goes, like yeah, because yeah, it's, it's you know because yeah. it's the same people running each running each holiday, you know, showing back up every year. Yeah, but like, I appreciate that it is a small piece of story. Like right. I don't feel angry. Like I wish I could play through that and it would be fun, but I don't feel mad about it like yeah. I do about Destiny. Yep. Like they're not. They're not. They're not taking away any of the actual story. Like I. I can. I, I mean, I'm. I'm doing that right now because I've. I decided. You know, since they added the whole thing where you can play through the story instances with NPCs, you know, I figured I'll start a new character and re-experience the early story. And it's, yeah, and it's yeah, fun. I've contemplated doing that. I mean, pres- presumably when I get to the, to the Titan trial, I may actually, the, no, the first time you fight Titan is a format in it. Yeah. So I'll probably yes. have, yeah, I'll have some random scions along with me. Cause that's what happened for a free. Yeah, because because I, I had a moment for the if the Efreet one, it was like, wait a minute, like what what is the explanation for how there are other people here to fight him with me that aren't tempered? Because like that's the whole thing here is that this is when we when you the player learn about tempering, but your the, the NPCs with you are other scions, so they presumably are scions who had the echo. Well, that's if you're playing with scions. I I still like the idea that. You've just sort of always been doing these fights with a bunch of random like people, and you, the player, diegetically was like, "Oh well, this is just like the game. These aren't really like whatever." Like we never sort of acknowledge their existence, and then later on, it's like, "Oh no, these are actually like reflections of you from other shards." Well, eventually they are. Like that's. Like, that's the explanation for how you're able to get people, you know, to get some random people to help you out, you know, when you're fighting, you know, a giant sad bird at the end of time. <laughs> but yeah, but like but when the, you're fighting Efreet, it's just like there there are other adventures with the Echo. Like, you know, it's uh, it's is, like that, it's rare, but it's not that rare. Like, is is that explained that way explicitly? I mean, the fact that the Echo is is re is rare but not like unique to you yeah i guess i don't know i now i i retroactively think of them as all being shards of you across time i mean there's multiple points in stormblood where they're like you know if like you just happen to have some friends like you know that are just you know randomly over here as well like you should totally ask them to give you a hand with this fair enough okay tell us about how ixian does boss fights yeah so Oh, man. So Ixion is uh, a city builder that's really good at surprising me uh, because I I don't expect things like a boss fight in my city builder. But like you're in, a, you're in basically an arc ship and you can move around and collect materials and the game kind of introduces you to the idea of like hazards in space that can cause you problems or uh, problems for your for your like support ships or whatever. And eventually eventually this culminates into like legitimately you fight a warship and you know you're not a warship so it's really interesting watching the game be like okay okay we got hit by a missile but our engineers reverse engineered this missile and we can make more to fire them out of the probe base (laughs) like okay we can we can fire we can repurpose the probe base to fire missile countermeasures you know we can do the you know it's like we do this and that and the other and you know protect ourselves against attacking attack it's info war attacks and and it's a really really cool sequence that i don't think i've seen in a game of this type like ever uh and like you still need to maintain people you know keeping keeping the lights on as it were while also you know evading these you know evading this this terrible ship and figuring out how you're going to, you know, beat it with science because you're sure not going to beat it with guns because you don't have any. Uh, And it's just, (laughs) it's a really clever, it's a really clever game that takes a bunch of pieces that I didn't, 
I didn't really see it coming and puts a twist on it that I think is really cool. And I think the last time I talked about Ixian, I had just sort of started it, but but it's set up in chapters and each chapter has some really interesting themes that it's that are all kind of building to this culmination. Like I'm in the last chapter now. Um and I, I accidentally kicked off a thing I did not want to kick off and died. <laughs> and like I saw it coming, but I didn't adequately prepare. Um but but what a cool like I don't know that it's gonna I don't know that it's gonna be a game with a ton of replayability. Um like there's a couple of different builds that you can do, but it really wants you to be aware of everything. So there's a lot of like it's not a, it's not the hugest tech tree, so it's not like oh I'm gonna do a completely different build this time. Um, well, and, it's, and there's no real there's no real random element to the to the game. Like events are in the same places and have the same options. Yeah, you know, um, and like it's very difficult to predict what the events are going to do, and I. I haven't. I'm not actually sure if there is a random element or not. There, there may or may not be. I don't. I, I I could believe either one. I I I broke down and checked out a wiki. <laughs> oh okay. But it it sure feels like because I got tired of picking an option and like, oh, your science ship blew up. Oh yeah. Well, but <laughs> yeah. It's, it's How like, was oh, I that's... supposed to know that was going to happen? Yeah. It's like oh, that's that's pain. Um. But yeah, like I'm really enjoying this game. It's very, it's just, it's, it's very tight. It's very Frostpunk in space. And I liked Frostpunk a lot. And I think it, it, it takes some of the things that a lot of city builder games were doing and explores them in interesting ways that I haven't seen before. And like, now that I'm towards the end, it's like, oh, this is very cool. But anyway, I was just so, uh, I was so, I was just so hyped at like Sim City with a boss fight. What? That's pretty cool. And it just works. Like it, it's building off of all of the stuff that it's taught you so far, such that you're like, oh yeah, I understand how to do this, despite never having seen this coming. So I know we talked about This Means Warp last week, um, but Kodra, you've had a chance to play it multiplayer? Yeah, we got a chance to play it multiplayer, uh, Tam, I, and a friend, and it's pretty cool. Um, it, It definitely does a good job of like, having various stations that people can be in, but hey, maybe it makes sense for them to to flex around. And there's a bunch of different types of battles in the base scenario that have different strategies and especially coordinating together. Like I, I imagine some of the challenges with coordination would be really hard single player without somebody to talk to, but like, if you can get two people focusing their fire on a single uh, wall, you can uh, be like, hey, let's vent out the enemy crew that are right next to this wall by both of us attacking it at the same time. And that's a lot of fun because that buys you a lot of time where their ship isn't getting crewed. Uh, Tam, I don't know how far you got, but we managed to unlock a new ship and the new ship changes things pretty dramatically. Oh, we gotten farther multiplayer than I had gotten solo. Yeah, okay. Like, in the first ship you get, all of your guns have a single slot for ammo, and a single slot of ammo can basically shoot one volley of attacks. Um, the second ship has a bunch of batteries, and when a, a when a section of the ship is charged, it'll just automatically reload uh the stuff in that the the guns in that section and it takes a certain amount of time so but you don't have to run and get a new battery or new bullet to to fire it up however you can overcharge which causes your guns to like cool down the ammo to refresh more rapidly and all of your guns uh are able to shoot much faster which means you will very quickly overheat them. You will very quickly run out of battery, but you can do just a ton of damage and strategically figuring out how to build a like cadence of, okay, I want to overheat my guns to do a bunch of damage to various sections of this enemy ship while then spending the time to like get the batteries re-uploaded once the entire sector goes dark. It, It was fun. It was very fun. We played for like three hours and I was 
very engaged the entire time. It was quite frantic. I am looking forward to trying it with four people. It seems like it would be great. Yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. Multiplayer FTL. It's very fun. But like last week, it sounded like this was just kind of a universally better FTL. I will say that I have not played enough FTL to like comment on that. I think that the um, so the things that it has over FTL, the fact that you are a like an actual entity on the ship versus sort of directing people around real time strategy style uh, makes it feel like much more active and weighty. Um, And also just like the variance is way higher. There's just a lot of different types of things you can do, whereas FTL was mostly ship fight or select from a menu option of things that might happen. And this has like, you know, test the ship systems or collect stuff that's flying around outside the ship or put out fires or, you know, even the even the combat scenarios are pretty varied. Oh, yeah. Sometimes uh, Tam would have to yell at me to get out of the guns because it's almost completely broken and he needs to repair them. <laughs> and I'm like, I, I'm like, I'm just sitting there, hands on the triggers, pulling them as fast as possible, not noticing that like the ship is falling apart around me. I'm like, oh, OK, yeah, good, good call. Good call. Uh, you can shoot doors, which is hilarious because you can't get through doors until they're repaired which means you can trap crew inside of there. Yeah, like FTL locks the ability to fight strategically behind ship upgrades, whereas uh, this means warp just gives you, uh, it just gives you perfect information. And that makes that makes a bunch of things much more interesting because you can, you can really think about what, what you're doing and why. I mean, my, my favorite thing to do that Coder mentioned is, you know, blow out a bulkhead and send a bunch of the crew out into space. Because <laughs> then it's just <clears throat> that much longer before they can do anything. And they can do the same to you. Like, hey, your repair person just got sucked out into the void. Going to be like, real hard to repair for a while. Yeah. There, there are a bunch of, like, next order strategies that I've been... I, we were, I was starting to toy with, like, trying to get certain bulk holds low on health so that I could like blow them out at a moment's notice at a more opportune time. It, it it does give you a lot more control in the like how you're going to assign your damage. And it also there each sector has a different thing that makes some of the strategies very different. Like we entered a sector where one of the things was all of the guns had two armor, which meant you dealt two less damage to guns. And a good strategy is to try and destroy their guns so they can't shoot at you. But if you're in that sector, you kind of have to figure out something else to do. Because you're just not going to be able to punch through that much armor. So you focus on bulkheads, or you focus on trying to blow up their ammo dispensaries. Yeah, it's like, because it because it gives you better information, you can do more interesting things strategically. And also it means that the... the uh, encounters are more interesting and I boy the space station is hilarious yeah the space station is hilarious it's it's you, there's a button that if you shoot it it switches to the next one and each space station basically has a countdown before they shoot off a missile at you that will blow your entire ship up and so you have to like switch periodically between the three stations yeah it's a really it's a really clever take on the like classic MMO, all of these things need to die at the same time. There's also like the the repairing is interesting because there is a point at which you repair something that you basically retain full health, but if you don't get to it in time, you'll take permanent damage to your ship that you basically don't get a chance to repair. And so like that's sort of the timer. Although there are certain things that give you like higher total hit point which means that like we were hovering around 33 40 hp for most of our our longest run and then i think the first ship in the fourth sector just completely destroyed us because uh we were not ready oh yeah that was rough so thalen is this topic an indication that you've been playing the pixel remasters on the switch 
I mean, that and also Final Fantasy XIV. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because Final Fantasy IV is great. And yeah, I picked up the Pixel Remasters because like I've I've I had considered them in the past on the PC and one of the things that the Switch version did is added classic font, which, you know, like I my I my ideal font would be the smoothness of the modern font, but the size of the classic font. But if I only have to pick one, I'll take the larger classic font that I can actually read from a distance. Yes. Because, you know, I, I, I am old and my eyes are getting old. Um, but yeah. yeah seeing and, Final Fantasy with Arial font was cool the first time I saw it, but I kind of preferred the old one. Yeah. But yeah, no, Final Fantasy IV remains, like, in, in part for nostalgic reasons, because I still clearly remember, you know, very clearly remember renting Final Fantasy IV and playing through the entire thing in a weekend and then actually playing through it about one and a half times over the course of a weekend uh because as soon as i finished i finished it i started over from the beginning and saw you know just how far i could get in get through again but yeah it's it remains a great game and simultaneously i've finally been catching up on all of the stuff that's been added into final fantasy 14 since you know since endwalker because i'd I'd played through the main endwalker story and then I ran for a little bit and then kind of took a break. So, and all of basically all of the post main Endwalker story is uh, centered around Golbez and the Four Fiends. Uh, but instead of being on the moon, Golbez is in the 13th. And strange stuff is happening there. Uh, I've, I've reached the point now where I've, I've unlocked the, the trial to fight Barbaricia and I need to get enough energy like personal energy to be willing to you know queue for that and play through it but yeah yeah that's always a challenge yeah because at least like four man dungeons story dungeons i can do them as a trust and i can just go in with uh in this case with uh Estinian and ishtola and um uh vritra who vritra is you know just a, just as good at doing whatever you need him to do as uh, as Grahatia was. So, yeah, I I came to the realization this week that I think part of the reason why I've gone so hard into ARPGs is that every bit of that content is accessible solo. Yep, and <laughs> and in like an MMO, like I almost always play them solo, other than rare occasions when I get to play with other people. Yeah, like I I like having I like having the option to play with my friends and do a thing with nope. my friends, but I don't really want to have to deal with random people. Like probably it'll be fine, but but yeah, but you, you make it up to be so much worse in your head. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I just and I and I feel more pressure to be good at the game. Like I feel like I have to research the fight beforehand mm-hmm. and well, because you don't want to be an inconvenience to someone else. Yeah. It's rude to be bad at Warcraft. Exactly. Yeah. This Which is, is a long... fantastic thing to watch, by the way. I don't know yes. It really it. is. That's, yeah, that's a, that's a very good video uh, and very accurate. But yeah, so that's a long way of saying that also, so all, there's like lots and lots of content that's been added to Final Fantasy fourteen. Like there's new Hildebrand stuff, which continues to be hilarious. And that's what the, what the, um, the relic weapons are locked behind this time around which i think is extra hilarious um <laughs> there's there's fights with the the four fiends or well so far the the ones that i've experienced are the fiend of earth and then i'm i'm at the point where i need to fight the fight the fiend of wind and then i th- i think the fight against it sounds like kenazo and rubicant you deal with simul like together and i think that's in the game i'm not sure um there's a new deep dungeon, which at some point I'd, I'd, I'd like to be able to get three of three of my friends to also log in and maybe try out the deep dungeon as a group because it has some story related to the Crystal Tower and the Allegan Empire. Yeah, I've heard that it's kind of more serious than the previous deep dungeons have been. Yeah, I mean it's similar gameplay, just like you're you're starting out at level eighty one, and it does seem like things have a lot of hit points. 
Like, I did successfully solo the first 10 floors as a red mage because, you know, red mage is broken. Uh, but it was like the timer was tight. It, it nearly it took me almost the full 60 minutes. There's new tribal quests that are great because, you know, you can help out the bunny people and the killer robots and the elephants who have to, who ride hippo carts. And they're all a lot of fun. Is there going to be like, have they announced the next expansion? I mean, they haven't announced what it is, but there is going to be one. I mean, okay. there's a fan fest coming up, so yeah. I assume at some point during that there will be an announcement. Yeah, the, the, the latest information we have, like just recently released, we got a the release date for 6.4, which will be the next, you know, next bit of the story. Yeah, and right now they've got the Moogle Tome Stones going on until that drops, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for like, I guess the next two weeks. But yeah, if you if you haven't been in a while in a while, there's there's a lot of content built up, and it's it's a lot of fun. I'm really curious where the uh, the current story is he- story is headed with everything with Golbez and the fiends and the thirteenth because like just just up through the point that I'm at, there have been some some reveals as to like the way certain things work in that shard that like th- there there are some possible implications. And I'm I'm curious to see exactly what like this stuff will lead to. One day I will pop back in to see the story. That's kind of my reaction. They are such good writers, though. Mm-hmm. Uh, any final thoughts? Any short topics? I don't think so. Uh, by the time this show releases, and we probably should have said this at the beginning, it will be Mother's Day. So happy Mother's Day to uh, all all the mothers within our uh, sphere of influence. Mm-hmm. And, and kindness to those of you who are missing your mothers or who don't have a great relationship with them. Yeah. Oh. Anyway, hopefully you'll enjoy the show and we will see you again next week. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.